Numbers chapter 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the inside of their father's house. Far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. And on the east side, toward the rising of the sun, shall they of the standard of the camp of Judah pitch throughout their armies. And Nashon, the son of Amminadab, shall be captain of the children of Judah. And his host, and those that were numbered of them, were threescore and fourteen thousand and six hundred. And those that do pitch next unto him shall be the tribe of Issachar, and Nathaniel, and the son of Zuar, shall be captain of the children of Issachar. And his host, and those that were numbered thereof, were fifty and four thousand and four hundred. Then the tribe of Zebulon, and Eli, of the son of Helon, shall be captain of the children of Zebulun. And his host, and those that were numbered thereof, were fifty and seven thousand and four hundred. All that were numbered in the camp of Judah were a hundred thousand and fourscore thousand and six thousand and four hundred throughout their armies. These shall first set forth. On the south side shall be the standard of the camp of Reuben according to their armies, and the captain of the children of Reuben shall be Eluzer, the son of Shedir, and his host, and those that were numbered thereof, were forty and six thousand and five hundred. And those which pitch by him shall be the tribe of Simeon, and the captain of the children of Simeon shall be Shilumiel, the son of Zerai Shaddai, and his host, and those that were numbered of them, were fifty and nine thousand and three hundred. Then the tribe of Gad, and the captain of the sons of Gad, shall be Elisap, the son of Reuel, and his host, and those that were numbered of them, were forty and five thousand and six hundred and fifty. All that were numbered in the camp of Reuben were an hundred thousand and fifty and one thousand and four hundred and fifty throughout their armies, and they shall set forth in the second rank. Then the tabernacle of the congregation shall set forward with the camp of the Levites in the midst of the camp. As they encamp, so shall they set forward every man in his place by their standards. On the west side shall be the standard of the camp of Ephraim, according to their armies, and the captain of the sons of Ephraim shall be Elish, uh, Elishama, the son of Amih, Amihud, and his host, and those that were numbered of them, were forty thousand and five hundred. And by him shall be, be the tribe of Manasseh, and the captain of the children of Manasseh shall be Gamaliel, the son of Pedicuser, and his host, and those that were numbered of them, were thirty and two thousand and two hundred. Then the tribe of Benjamin, and the captain of the sons of Benjamin, shall be Abid, Abid, Abidam, the son of Gideon, Gideon, and his host, and those that were numbered of them, were thirty and five thousand and four hundred. All that were numbered of the camp of Ephraim were one hundred thousand and eight thousand and a hundred throughout their armies, and they shall go forward in the third rank. The standard of the camp of Dan shall be on the north side by their armies, and the captain of the children of Dan shall be Ahizir, the son of Amin, Amin Shaddai, and his host and those that were numbered of them were threescore and two thousand and seven hundred. And those that encamp by him shall be the tribe of Asher, and the captain of the children of Asher shall be Pagiel, the son of Okran, and his host and those that were numbered of them were forty and one thousand and five hundred. Then the tribe of Naphtali, and the captain of the children of Naphtali, shall be Ahira, the son of Enan, and his host, and those that were numbered of them, were fifty and three thousand and four hundred. All they that were numbered in the camp of Dan were one hundred thousand and fifty and seven thousand and six hundred. They shall go hindmost with their standards. These are those which were numbered of the children of Israel by the house of their fathers, all those that were numbered of the, of the camps throughout their hosts were six hundred thousand and three thousand and five hundred and fifty. But the Levites were not numbered among the children of Israel, as the Lord commanded Moses. And the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. So they pitched by their standards, and so they set forward every one after their families, according to the house of their fathers.
Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this chapter. We can read from your word in Numbers chapter 2. I just pray that you would use it in our lives today as our pastor comes before us to preach your word, Lord. I pray that you would preach what you've given him. I mean, he would preach what you've given him, Lord, and that you, he would be your mouthpiece to, to say what you'd have him to say, Lord, and that he'd convict us of sin, Lord, and, and um, that he'd show us the way of truth, and he would rebuke, exhort, and, that, and with all long suffering and doctrine, Lord, I just pray that you bless this day, Lord, help my father as he's not feeling very well, and I just pray you bless the rest of our day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Numbers chapter 2. So a lot of times people will be like, when they're reading a chapter like this, what does this have to do with me today? You know, this is, this is not something that I typically do wandering around the desert in a camp. This is not something I typically do. But we need to understand that everything that is written is for our learning. Everything that is written is for our example. Uh, all scripture is profitable, even the ones full of names, even the ones full of this is how you're going to camp, this is how you're going to set up camp, this is how you're going to put up and down camp, even the ones that talk about this is the fabric of the temple, this is this and everything. Things that we would typically think, well, that has no spiritual significance. It actually does have a spiritual significance to it. Now, obviously, we don't want to over allegorize something, you know, the, the, the camel hair meat and it's fine and black means that this and that and the other thing or whatever. We don't want to go too far into that. But there is a lot of things that we can take from this is talking about organization of a camp in the wilderness. And so last week we talked about how that a lot of times there will be people that are not necessarily lost, but they're not necessarily in the promised land. They're, they're in the wilderness wanderings. They are, uh, they are not quite solidly in either place. They're not in the bondage of sin. They're not in the promised land of, of victory and power. Now, obviously, when the children of Israel were in the promised land, they had struggles, they had problems, they had issues. But the promised land is a picture of the person who is, in, in one sense, now, obviously, it doesn't hold true for every single time, person and generation in their in their land, but in one sense in this aspect from bondage to wondrous wilding uh, to, uh, to the promised land, it gives this aspect of being able to, even though you have struggles, being a solid Christian and being able to face them as a Christian rather than just trying to kind of wandering around in the land, oh, I'm not lost, but I'm not really saved, and I don't really live by anything. So the first thing he kind of teaches them is that obviously first of all they they assessed where they are and who they are and and, and uh, who's to do what and so the the first thing once you're out of out of um, once you are saved you need to find your place in the world if you will now that I'm a Christian how do I uh, relate to the rest of the world around me uh, how do I act in, in regards to God and here in the children of Israel, they've been given the law, they've been given all the commandments, they're taught what they're supposed to do. Now they're going to apply the things practically into their life. Uh, and so the, the first thing they did was they, they numbered who was able to battle, who's ready to go to help us, to, uh, to defend us, to, to protect us from the wickedness. Now, uh, uh, so the first thing we need to understand is that there are people that are going to be stronger than others. There are going to be people that are going to be able, to, once they're saved, just to go to war right away. They, they can protect, they can help the others, and, and so forth. And, but not everybody's going to be that way. There's going to be kids, they're going to be struggling, uh, they don't know how to relate, uh, and so forth. In, in chapter 2, it's kind of talking about how to organize them in a cohesive, organized way so that they can relate themselves to who they are in their individual families and to who God is uh, in His temple. And so what's happening is they're going to be organized uh, around the temple, and they're going to be organized around Levi. And so the first thing they, they learn is that once you get saved, you need to get into the church, if you will. You need to be organized. You need to figure out who you are in relation to God and his church, his people, his, his temple. And so we, uh, in this passage, we see that uh, this... It's kind of like, I don't think you can see it very well up here, but I, I drew a very bad diagram of this. It's basically Levi would be in the middle, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun would be over to the rising of the sun on the east side, and then we would have uh, Reuben, Simeon, and Gad, uh, they would be on the south side. Uh, that Reuben, uh, actually uh, Judah would be, when they broke camp, Judah would lead everybody, 
And then after them, the camp of Judah would be uh, Reuben's camp. They would be the second camp to head out after Judah. And then after them in the middle would be uh, the Levites. And in the middle of the Levites would be uh, the tabernacle. And uh, the ark would be smack dab in the center. And after that, heading up the rear end would be Dan and Asher and Naphtali. They would basically set up on the north side. Uh, up there, and then they would be uh, Ephraim and then Manasseh, and they would head up the back end, and so that in the middle, whether they're camped, or whether they were uh, traveling, uh, the temple of the Lord would be in the middle of them all. They would be uh, relating themselves in regards to the temple. So the first thing we see here is that we need to regard ourselves when we're saved to determine, not by say, for example, Judah did not determine where they were depending on who, where Ephraim was or, or anything like that. They would be like, where are we in relation to the temple? Where are we in relation to God? Where are we in relation to traveling? Uh, uh, what are we supposed to do? Now notice there also that in addition to that, they were organized into four distinct different camps. They were, uh, the, the temple was in the middle, but the Judah, uh, the one camp was led by Judah. See, there's four tribes, Judah, Reuben, and e Ephraim, and Dan were the leaders of each camp. And in each, each tribe had an individual that led that camp. So, so what this is saying is that you need to find out what tribe you're in, what camp you're in, and then where is that camp in relation to, uh, and to God. So we have the individual, then we have the uh, standard of his father, and then we have the, the tribe that is in, and then what camp he is in, and then where is that camp in relation to the four other major camps. And, and so what this is showing is that, is that while our life, and especially their life, six million uh, Israelites here at this time, is that their whole society is supposed to be organized around the temple and the Lord. And so we as Christians need to realize that our, our life needs to be organi organized around our church. Now, we can see this more distinctly in things like um, uh, the Amish, for example. Uh, their society is organized around their, um, their basically their pastor. Uh, their pastor, their church, and then their society is organized around their church. And so their internal society is determined, the laws and rules and things in their society are determined by their pastor and their church. Now, obviously, we don't live that way. We're not, we don't determine uh, necessarily our general society like the Amish do, uh, but we're more, uh, more like our individual church still, our church life, and then there's a social life that is determined by the government and all these different things. But as a Christian, we need to be centered around God in particular. We need to be focused on God. And a lot of times people say, well, I'm focused on God, I'm looking towards the temple, but all these other denominations, you know, you, you always have this question that comes up, all these other denominations out there, they can't be true because the uh, Bible says that we're all supposed to be in unity, you know, we're all supposed to be this one thing and singing kumbaya and holding each other's hands and, and, and unity is the most important thing. Now, obviously, uh, people, there's this, always this battle between truth and unity. Everybody's like, this is the truth. Divide from all others. Divide from all others. And then other people are like, this is unity. Uh, uh, ignore all truth. Ignore all truth. And so it's like a battle between the two. But we need to realize that, that truth and unity go together. Uh, 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 judgment and mercy go together. They are equal parts of God. And, and so when somebody is seeking to have only truth, what happens when they see a lie? Now, they're very harsh with people that have a lie. They're very harsh with people that have a difference of opinion with them. Their, their spirit becomes uh, very defensive of what they see to be the truth. And is very heartless, a very uh, legalistic type of person that holds only to the truth. But then if you see somebody who holds only to love and, and unity and, and, and uh, above all else, then you'll see somebody who becomes corrupt and horrid and, and, and evil eventually because they 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 love they, there is so much about unity that they get bitter and angry at anybody who seeks to to divide for any reason or whatever but if you have both together what do you have somebody who loves truth and mercy and unity and he's long-suffering 
and he's willing to uh, be a teacher. He's willing to guide people to the truth. He's willing to uh, suffer along with people. And so we see how that unity and truth together can create somebody who has great wisdom. Uh, and so unity should not be greater than truth, but truth should not be greater than unity. How, how, how wonderful it is for my people to dwell in unity. And then there's, there's a whole verse about that, you know, the, how it's like the dew of, uh, of, uh, of the mountains and all this stuff, but, but that's not part of the verse. But basically, uh, truth and unity need to be together, and then because truth is all about what uh, the mind and all about what God has declared, and unity is all about the spirit. We are one spirit. We are one people. And so we notice here in this passage that there are a lot of people. There's like six million people, there's people that are able to go to war, and they're all centered around the temple. So you have you have four camps, you have 12 tribes, and then in those tribes you have families. And so unity does not look like everybody's all generic singing kumbaya, my lord, kumbaya. No, they are, they have distinctness about them. They have separation about them. They have not only, there's not just different tribes, which we could come, in, in, in this very rough idea you could, uh, that I'm trying to get towards, you can get this idea that there's four, four camps, and I can be in a camp of Christians, and then you can be in a camp of Christians, and we are diff different camps, but if we're centered and focused on God, doing His will, then it doesn't matter what camp I'm in, we're focused on God, that's where the unity is. But I can also be in one camp, and but in a different tribe. So uh, if I'm in a different tribe, I don't go around harassing all the other tribes, saying, "Oh, I'm in the tribe of Judah. You guys are just peons. You're from you're from Benjamin. Oh, you're you're not that great. You're you know we're, we're all fighting and bickering among us people because we're in different tribes, or we're in the same camp, but we're in a different tribe of the same camp." And, and we're all bickering and fighting over everything because, oh, I have the truth, our, our, our standard is correct, our, our this and that is correct, and, and you should unite around us, and, and they're trying to make everybody... No, the, the camp is centered around God. And, and so we notice here that with four camps, 12 tribes, and then individual families, is that a Christian uh, can be in unity in the body of Christ, in, in uh, around, centered around God's people, you know, the kingdom of heaven can be in unity and still be in different tribes. Uh, now, uh, we can debate over, you know, all that Catholic camp or you know, the Catholic group is it, all lost and we can talk about heretics and all that stuff, but that's what I'm not, I'm not talking about that right now. I'm talking about true born-again Christians that are not necessarily, uh, we don't all agree on the same thing, even among Baptist churches, the, and you can see different camps arising. Uh, you can see there's a Southern Baptist, uh, um, they don't call it a denomination, it's technically a denomination, but anyway, we'll get, we'll get to that later, but there's like Southern Baptist and American Baptist, and then there's a, a Primitive Baptist, and there's Independent Baptist, and we're all in different camps, and then among those different groups, you can have the, uh, uh, you know, the, the whole joke about uh, uh, our, what, what uh, type of Christian you are. I'm a Baptist Christian. Oh, that's wonderful. What type of Baptist? Oh, uh, I'm a Southern Baptist. Oh, what type of Southern Baptist? Oh, I'm a Southern Baptist 1864 or whatever convention. Oh, die heretic. You know, it's like it's the wrong group. But, uh, but basically, what I'm getting at is that you can be a, a Christian in your camp without being threatened by people not in your camp. Uh, and because ultimately this whole camp here is centered around God. How do we tell if somebody is not part of Israel? Well, first of all, they're not in any of the camps. They're not in any of the tribes. And they're not focused on the Lord. And, and so if somebody comes along and says, well, here's what you need to center your life around. And then it's not centered around God. Then you can know that guy's a heretic. He's trying to deceive you. He's trying to take you out of the camp. But... If somebody is coming along and he's focused on God and he is focused on uh, and, and he's in a, a faithful tradition uh, of Christianity, is focused on God and trying to do the Lord's will, 
then debating and fighting and, 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 and saying that guy is not truly uh, a son of God because he has this certain doctrine a certain way, and that certain doctrine a certain way. And he may be right or wrong on that doctrine, but that, that doctrine does not determine whether or not he's in our camp or in some other group. And so this camp is focused on God in relation not to the other camps, but to God. And so this is what we need to get through through our stubborn, stiff-necked heads, just like they had to, is that, is that if we are in the tribe of Simon and in the camp of Reuben, then our focus should not be on all the other tribes. Our focus should be on where are we in relation to the temple? Where are we in relation to God's people? Where are we in relation to that? And so, so we as Christians need to not be focused on all the other camps out there. I'm not, now obviously if somebody comes up and says, oh, the Catholic tradition is true and all this stuff. Now, first of all, I, I, I believe that the, the different things about the Catholic Church, I don't want to go into all that right now. I don't have the time. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> but for, for uh, illustration's sake, is that I'm not concerned with what's happening in the Catholic camp. That is not an interest to me. I'm not a Protestant. I'm not going to go around protesting everything that the Catholics have done in a long history and all the evils they are and how that their Pope is the Antichrist and all these things. Now, may I, might I believe some of that stuff? Probably, uh, most likely. Uh, and may I believe that uh, that the camp is 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 a bad camp and, and it should you know that they need to reform and do all these things? Probably, but I have no interest in that. What my interest is is on is the church of God, is is the temple of God, is the body of Christ, is the focusing on the kingdom of heaven. Now, obviously, if, if they come in, and I and, and I personally believe they're heretic church in a way, but uh, again, I'm not trying to not trying to go down rabbit trails. But basically, I need to focus on where God is in relation to me, and let Him take care of the rest of the camp. I'm not Moses. I'm not the guy leading the whole thing. You know, Jesus Christ. Is leading his people. Jesus Christ is running his kingdom. I don't need to be fighting and, and badly. You know, obviously the, the Catholic Church believes that they are Israel and that they need to take up arms and, and historically they would uh, battle uh, to win territory for the Lord, if you will. Uh, no, we as Baptist Christians and, and believers, we believe that people are converted to Christ by, uh, by the message of Jesus Christ and by the gospel, not by the sword. And, and so, and, and so we would we would disagree with people, especially other religions like the Muslims, that say, "Oh, you can win people to Allah by the sword, and, and conquer people by the sword, and subjugate them by the sword, in order to uh, increase your religion." We would disagree with that. And uh, the Catholic Church has historically been similar to that. They've been fighting like that for a while, and they think that they have the um, they as as Christians have the power of the sword. We as Christians don't believe that. Uh, we believe Christ has that, though. But um, so uh, focusing on our relation to the Lord and where we are, and, and so that is that is kind of what we get in this general idea is that these people, it, it was led by God, uh, by His prophet, and, and you know by by Moses. And then Aaron was the Levite there as well, and they were in charge of the camp. And so we understand as Christians that God is in heaven, he's running the whole show, it's his creation, and then God, Jesus Christ is standing by his side. He is 100% uh, God, 100% man, and he is ruling and reigning from heaven over his people. Our focus is not supposed to be on the heretics or the other religions or anything like that. Our focus is supposed to be on God first and then in relation to the camp that we are in. Uh, and so we understand that if, if a group is not focused on God, they're probably not in God's camp. But if a group is focused on God, they're probably in God's camp, but not in the same camp that we are in. Uh, and so there's four different camps there, and I'm not going to try to try to stretch the illustration to say, well, this group of people are in the camp and that group of people are not in the camp, because what I'm trying to focus on in this message is who are we in relation to God and in relation to the greater whole of Christianity. Uh, we don't need to be in some generic group. 
we can have distinctions. We can have a standard. We can see here in this, in this picture here that their focus was on the temple. They traveled in relation to the temple. Later on we're going to see how that uh, the cloud of God's glory would be above the temple. The angel that was in that, the, the angel of the Lord that was uh, in that glory uh, would be upon the temple. And when that glory moved, the camp would move. And when the glory stopped, the camp would stop. And the temple would be assembled underneath that uh, cloud. And so whenever the cloud moved, they would move. And so their focus was not on who's the other tribe, uh, who's right and who's wrong. Their focus was on following the Lord. So when you are in that wilderness time, it is not time to, I just got saved, now it's my time to jump onto Facebook and start fighting people on doctrines and start fighting people on all these other different things and starting and then you know and, and people uh, there you know and, and this uh, product of our culture is the is the internet culture uh, within the last 10 15 years it, it's entirely changed the mindset of a lot of people and, and what happens is a, a young Christian gets saved by watching something on YouTube he's not plugged into a church. He's not, he's not uh, fully integrated into the things of God. He doesn't, he has maybe not quite read the Bible completely through yet. And, and he is focused on his relationship with God uh, in his camp because maybe he got saved by, by watching some YouTube thing and he's not quite plugged in somewhere. And then the, the pastor on his YouTube, he's following him, he's learning, he's growing in some areas, but, not, uh, but he's not quite reading the Bible, not quite plugged in into not sure where he's at. He's still in his wandering. He's still wandering in the wilderness of his spiritual life, if you will. And then they see something wrong or different than they're used to uh, on Facebook or, or internet, and they're like, "The horror! That's not how it was said by the person who led me to the Lord." And, and then they would start fighting and getting out there, and they start fighting with uh, mature Christians in other camps that have been saved for 40 plus years and they have been taught a certain way and it's not necessarily the wrong way it's just a different perspective of the correct way uh, and, and so forth like that now obviously there are heresies and things and, and I understand how the people want to contend against it and all that stuff but but what I'm explaining here is that people that are particularly in wilderness times they're not the warriors they're not the people that are in uh, the promised land and that they're fighting valiantly for the Lord according to his way and established things, they are in the wilderness time where they, they're not lost and they're saved and they have a passionate zeal for the things of God, but they don't know the whole counsel of God yet. They're, they're not established yet, and yet they want to go battle on their own for the Lord. Notice in this camp, everybody was in relation to the temple, and they were by their own standards in their own camps, and they were in their own families. You see, we don't have in, 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 in the Bible, even in the nation of Israel, and also in the, nation, in, in, the, uh, in the church of God, if you will, there is not this general idea of scattered, meaningless, uh, generic uh, Christianity. It is a picture of organized standards that people stand by and are focused on and then gathering together under that standard and say, hey, this is what we believe. Now, obviously, there's individual differences and in opinions, but ultimately, this is what we believe. Wilderness time is learning what you believe, learning where to stand in relation to God, learning where you are in the camp of God, uh, and, and so forth. Now, obviously, we're not born as in the children of Israel were born into their particular tribe and family and so forth, but we are, in, in one sense of the word, uh, they, uh, the Apostle Paul said, Be not many masters, and call not many fathers. I am the one who saved you. I am your father after the faith. I am the one who converted you. So if, you, if somebody has saved you and invested that time in you, you should, in your wilderness time of wandering, now I'm not saying that that person who saved you and converted you is going to be right on every single thing. But that is your father in the faith, if you will. He spoke the words of life, and, and, and through Jesus Christ, through that person, saved your soul. You should have more respect for that person, for what he has done for you in your life. 
than any other Christian. Be not many masters. Don't go seeking after many different things. Figure out what that person who saved you believes and, and, and what he has. Stand under his standard. Uh, be loyal to that man. Be loyal to your, your local independent church as well. Is that perhaps a lot of people, like I said, it's internet age. People will get saved. People will get converted by people that are many, many miles away. And then they'll, they'll maybe get saved online or they'll get not necessarily saved, but then they'll be, they may have got saved as a little kid and then they got strengthened online. And then they, but then they don't have the local church where they are, so they need to get plugged in. And the local church that invests time in them, that's where they need to learn. That's where they need to grow. And once they're established in that standard, then they can branch out and say, hey, uh, maybe this thing is not quite right in what I've been taught. Maybe this is not quite right. But they should do that slowly and very methodically and very carefully because that person is the, because it's after the spirit not after the letter that we are to be assembled. And, and so what, what I'm trying to get to is this, is that, is that we should, especially even today more so, should not forsake the gathering together and ourselves together, but rather we should be gathered together under our standard and say, what do we as Baptists, independent Baptists, believe uh, and what has been taught in our groups? We shouldn't be going, or a lot of people, especially in this late time and age, they will take a little bit from the Reformed group, they'll take a little bit from the Calvinist group, they'll take a little bit from the Armenian group, they'll take a little bit from uh, the Catholic thing, or the cult thing over here, but they don't know what their very own standard, they'll claim to be Baptist, but they don't know what the Baptist tr traditionally taught. Uh, or they'll uh, or they will take uh, from some uh, errant Baptist group, and then say, oh, that is that is what we should all believe, and, and everybody else from 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 John the Baptist is wrong until we came along, you know. No, that, now obviously there are things, especially in history, that have believed for a long time, but the Bible says something completely different. The Reformation, uh, you know, by Luther, uh, the reason why that they there became a Reformation is because for the longest time the Catholic Church says don't read that Bible, don't don't read that thing. No, obviously. All, all the Baptists at that time were called heretics. You know, if, if the Catholics say heretic, that group is heretic, that, that's probably because they're following the Bible. Uh, but then Luther kind of basically said, the emperor has no clothes. What you guys are teaching is nowhere close to the Bible. And, and, we can't, and they could no longer say, well, we believed and taught this for thousands of years. Our church has been teaching this for thousands of years. No, uh, the... the the center focus is, is if your individual group, if you find out that group is not focused on God and His Word, and they're kind of off on their own little old area, then don't follow that group. But if you're, if the person who saved you and converted you to Christ, and then the church that has invested time into you, and, and that is where your standard ought to be, and they're focused on God and His Word, and not fighting everybody else, and not trying to go off all, all, all crazy into new doctrine, they're trying to honestly focus on God and follow God, then that's where your standard ought to be. And that's where theirs were in their nation. They were focused on God. They were in the, in the camp and in the tribe that God had planted them, that put them, because they didn't have a choice on where they were going to go there. So too is that when you heard the words of life, that is the person who converted you. And so you need to focus on, well, what does my spiritual father believe? What is he honestly trying to focus on the Lord? Now, will that person have errors? Yes, he will. We all have errors somewhere. There's also areas where we're trying to grow and develop. You know, then there's different opinions and thoughts. You know, like I said, I was, we, we had that con we were having a little conversation before beforehand, is that uh, for a while I thought that maybe Melchizedek is Shem or somebody like that, or maybe this or that, and because the Bible's not clear on that, it's a little harder to understand. Other people believe that uh, Melchizedek is Jesus Christ, and then other people will believe uh, maybe no, it's just a it's just a generic order of priesthood, and and, and how does that all work out? And, and there are things in that uh, are not milk that we should all know, but there are harder things, uh, technical things that we all may not know. And, and to say, well, you think that Melchizedek is Shem? Oh, you're a heretic. Yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna follow you. I'm gonna go this direction. No, uh, figure out why does that guy believe this? Why does that guy believe that? And and, and so. 
if you don't know yourself, there, there's no point in fighting over it. You know, so, so many people are so focused on the truth of God's word and not on unity that they would divide over who is Melchizedek. You know, we should not be doing such things. Uh, unity is more important than who is Melchizedek. Should, now, if I go around saying, well, Melchizedek uh, is not real, and, and Melchizedek, uh, uh, the Melchizedek priesthood, you know, Hebrews was a lie, and then, then I'm probably a heretic because I'm not focused on God's word. But uh, we understand that there is room for unsurety, particularly in the wilderness wanderings of our Christian life. And, and so, uh, so when we're trying to figure out what we believe and who we are in relation to God, we need to focus on the standards God has given to us. Here we see in this page, every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. And then it gives the, it gives the, uh, the standard and the amount of people that are there who are able to fight and able to protect and, and so forth. And so find out where your standard is. That, that is what that is what this chapter is telling you. Find your standard. Where are you in relation to God in heaven? Where are you in relation to the Baptist doctrine and the, the Baptist groups? Where are you in relation to your independent local church? Where are you in relation to the standards that God has set for you in your life? Where are you in relation to the Father who has birthed you by the Word? The, that person who converted you to Christ. Where are you in that? Where are you in the standards that God's placed in your life? Now again, there's uh, people's wilderness wanderings will look a little different depending on who you are. You know, at certain times of your life, you will, your focus, even in, for example, people will be focused in certain times of their life. You know, particularly as a kid, uh, a kid's life is kind of like a wilderness wandering. You're not, you're not, you're not not born, but you're not your own man. You're not your own woman. You're, you are in this time of life where you cannot determine things for yourself. You're learning math. You're learning English. You're learning how to talk. You're how, how to grow. How to bounce a basketball. How to do different things. You know, you're, you're learning and you're growing. And then there's time, especially teenage, is kind of a wilderness time as well, is where you're not quite a helpless infant, but you're not quite ready to be completely alone. Well, you may be able to feed yourself, clothe yourself, drive a car at 16 or whatever, but you may not understand how the financial system of this place works. And if you get lit, lit loose right away, then you're not gonna you're gonna think, well, I, when I was a kid, uh, I could just spend all this extra money on, on candy and and, and 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 rims for my car and all these fun things. I don't understand why my parents uh, are always concerned about money. It's just you know. It's, I, can, I got so much money right now, my pockets are bursting and all these things, and then, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, uh, the bills start coming, and dad and mom aren't there to, to, to go, and you're starting to see, hey, manhood is not quite what, what teenagehood is, you know? It's, it's, it's quite a little bit different. Now I have a family of my own, I find that the money's not coming all the way, it may be bold, it is no longer bulging because there's holes in my pockets that are going out, you know? <laughs> And so the, the parents have already been in that direction. They, they've already been established in that wilderness wandering. A lot of times we as, uh, as children of Israel be like stiff-necked and saying, man, I wish I could be in, the, in there now. I don't, I, I'm done with this wilderness wandering. No, you, you still got a ways to go. You, you're not quite there. But I'm not in bondage anymore. I can do what I want. No, just because you're free from Egypt does not mean you can do whatever you want. You need to be organized. You need to be set up properly. We as Christians are free from the bondage of sin, but if we are not careful, if we're not careful in our wilderness wanderings, we'll be tangled there and again. And so we need to understand, of course, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of heretic places out there that are, that are like the Amalekites, that are like uh, the people of the land are trying to draw you away from the camp. you got to be careful. Know where you are in relation to, the, in, to God and the camp. And, and so, yes, yeah, so there's, uh, there's a wilderness wandering time uh, of there's kids, and there are wilderness wandering times of individuals who are uh, just saved, need to learn where they are. And, and so that's where they are. They, they've gotten all the stuff. They, it's been about a year since they've been out, and they're, it's about another couple of months before they're about ready to make their first attempt into the promised land. And of course that doesn't work out, and so they have to spend their, that whole generation in this format. 
And so, so that, that's basically what I want to, to kind of use this chapter to help you understand is that there is a order to what God is doing today. There, there is an order that we don't look like we're in the same tribe or the same family, but we are in Christ. And I don't have to try to figure out which tribe over there is in Christ, and which tribe is heretic, which tribe is following the property, which tribe is not. What I have to figure out, where is God in relation to me, and where am I in relation to God, what camp am I in, and what local church am I in. So for me, as an individual, I don't need to figure out what are the Catholics doing, what are the Methodists doing, what are all these groups doing. Now, it's not for me to figure out, uh, I can warn you, hey, this practice that they're doing is wrong. Hey, th this organization, the way they're set up with the Pope is wrong. I can tell you that by in relation to my relationship with God, I can tell you what's wrong in the other camps. And, and oftentimes Baptists do. You know, we, we're not quiet on those things. It's not, it's not like there's a, a lack of opinion. But my primary focus needs to be on where am I in relation to God. So as an individual, I need to ask, who is God? Uh, what am I supposed to do for him? And then I need to say, who are the Baptists? Uh, why am I in this camp? Is it the right camp to be in? And then I need to say, who are the independent Baptists? Why, why am I hanging out with them? And then I need to ask myself, what's going on with this local church? Because not every, not every local church is good. Not every uh, independent group of people are good. Not every Baptist group of people are good. Not every, not every camp of Christians are, are good. Um, but we need to focus on where we are. If we can get our focus on God, then we can figure out what camp we need to be in, in relation to God. We can say, hey, is the Baptist the right camp? If they're the right camp, then what tribe of Baptist should I be in? Should I be Southern Baptist? Should I be American Baptist? Should I, uh, what, what camp am I in? And, and, uh, but then we can also do it. That's why I say there's so much today of like where, where are all these going. So that's why I say who converted you? That's the camp you should be in. Uh, because if you understand that God has connected to you by that individual, that's where you should be. God is connected to you in the tribes. When a person was born into the tribe, they didn't go around saying, well, should I be in the tribe of Reuben? Should I be in the tribe of this? No, he birthed you into that tribe of Naphtali. He, and you were in that family, that particular area. So that the area you were birthed in is where you were located. And so same way with the spiritual aspect of this, the person who converted you is the tribe of Christianity that you're uh, birthed in, it, it's so, sort of birthed into, if you will. And so I'm not saying don't convert to a different tribe if it's a bad tribe or whatever, but what I'm saying is that that's where you need to start. What does that person believe? And then should I go to a different tribe? Should I marry into, if you will, another camp uh, and so forth? Because we see uh, children of tribes that if a wife uh, if, a, if a woman uh, married a parent person, uh, in like a woman from Naphtali married a person of Judah, when she got married to them, they would become, uh, she would no longer be after Naphtali, she would be after Judah. And it also, an individual from outside of the camp, like a, like a, a stranger or somebody, who, like a Ruth from Moab, she got, she got uh, married into, uh, into, that, uh, into a tribe, and she became part of that tribe. So, so what I'm saying is that when you, you, to figure out where you're supposed to be, where does your, your belief, as an individual, the person who saved you, what does he believe, where does he go? And then as you understand where you are in relation to him and God, then you can understand who should I marry when the time comes. You know, maybe I got converted as a, uh, as maybe a Assembly of God person. You know, maybe the, the person had the right doctrine. I learned how to be an Assembly of God person. And, and, and Assembly of God is pretty close to Baptist anyway. And so, uh, and, and other than certain particular practices that we want to get into, and I don't have time to talk about the differences. But, uh, but basically, uh, say I was converted by Assembly of God person. But then I say, hey, my individual, and, and then I get grounded in my local church there. And then I say, hey, wait a second, you know, my local church doesn't quite believe this way. And hey, uh, the Assembly of God doesn't quite believe what I see in the Bible because I'm focusing on God, and then God is kind of moving me to where I'm, my standard is supposed to be. Uh, but I started out with the person who converted me. And so, so that's the important understanding is that as a person of wilderness wandering, you don't need to figure out 
all of this stuff, particularly. You need to get grounded with God and the person who converted you, and then God will move you as you seek his face to where you ought to be. And, and so that, that's important, a good principle there. Uh, now, people may bring up objections to that, but I think that is the best way to explain how you should do it. And, and of course, you know, the, the people that are right with the Lord will be out trying to win souls. Those that are wise will win souls. And, and uh, the more people that are out winning souls, the more that will be in the right camp, right? Logically. Uh, so, so if we as Baptists are following the Word of God, we're out door knocking. We're out, we're out uh, trying to, as, as in the process of life, converting people to Christ. Then those people that are converted to Christ, they ought to be coming to the Baptist church, right? So if the, uh, if the, um, if the uh, Assemblies of God people, you know, the, the, the church has get, got right with God and they're going out uh, soul winning and in the process of life, uh, converting people to Christ or door knocking or whatever, that people come by their way, then people are going to go to that church. That's just the way God has uh, set it up to be. And so that's where, and, and then as you learn, that's where you'll go. And, and so that, that's just kind of how you can learn. A lot of lost people, they don't need to find out where they are in relation to the camp. They need to find out where they are in relation to God. Uh, but uh, but uh, once you are saved, that is how you do it. And, and in wondrous wilderness, you don't determine all these things yourself. You allow where God has placed you to determine your relationship with God. It'll help you that way. It'll take a lot of confusion out. And, and so... <clears throat> So then we're moving on, I want to, uh, I could end there, but I want to point out a couple things about this of interest as we move on in, in this context and passage. Uh, this is not something that is stated distinctly in Scripture, uh, but oftentimes I see, see there's four tribes, or four camps, centered around this temple. Uh, so we got Judah, we got, uh, um, we got Reuben, and we got Ephraim, and then we got Dan. Uh, all centered around, and then what? And, and they were at the heads of each of these camps. So we have four of them in relation to God's temple. Traditionally, uh, there's not a verse that necessarily states this directly, but traditionally they say the ensign. It says, verse 34: The children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. So that they pitched by their standards. So they set forward everyone after their families according to the house of their fathers. So that's what we finished talking about. But uh, traditionally, uh, what they say is that each each camp had its own had its own standard, and on that standard was a picture. And, and traditionally, uh, uh, again, I, you can see some allusion to this, so that's why I'm bringing it up. Otherwise, I wouldn't bring it up. But traditionally, uh, the the Israelite people said that the uh, the standard of Judah was a lion. Now we understand this, this is the, the clearest picture, is that uh, in Revelation, of course, it says uh, uh, basically uh, the lamb, the tribe, the, the lion, the tribe of Judah. You know, Jesus Christ called the lion of the tribe of Judah, and, and so forth, and that, uh, that he has persevered to open the book, and so forth like that. And, and so we understand that Jesus is of the tribe of Judah, and he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the head of that. Uh, but also there are that the, traditionally they say that Judah was a lion, and then that um, Reuben, his ensign was a man, and then they say Ephraim's ensign was a calf, and then they say Dan's ensign was an eagle. Now that's the traditional thought because that relates to the um, just as in, in on Earth. You remember the tabernacle was pictured. Uh, is everything was in relation to God in heaven, uh, in the tabernacle, it was a picture of what was in heaven. And so the, the, the camps, the four camps, are a picture of the four beasts that are in heaven. The four beasts are the picture of just on earth as the four camps are centered around. So too are the four beasts centered around uh, the temple in heaven. And also when the temple came down in Ezekiel, that each, um, each cherub, on either on all four sides of that, um, on all four sides of the of the uh, throne that came down, Ezekiel chapter one verse ten it says, "As for the likeness of their faces, they four had a face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four also had the face of an eagle." 
And so the, the, uh, the four beasts, as they came down in Ezekiel, he saw that vision, uh, they all four had that, and also Ezekiel chapter 10, and everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub, which would be in relation to the cat. Uh, the second face was the face of a man, the third face, the third face of a lion, and the fourth face of an eagle. Of course, Revelation chapter 4, verse 7 says, And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, and the third beast the face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And so, that, so the, in heaven we have the four cherubs, and in the camp we also have the four, the four camps, the four camps broken up. And then also we have just like a, uh, on, either, on each, in each camp there was three tribes, and so a wheel within a wheel. And so in, in uh, Ezekiel, it was described as how that this throne had the four cherubs, one on either side, all sides, and then it was on top of a wheel within a wheel. And so the, the illusion here is that as they are in this camp, centered around this way, you have the four tribes after the four beasts of God. Now, in, in, the, in this picture, the tribes are, are focused and, and they're called beasts living beasts. And then, of course, we know the, the church is centered around the seven, you know, the tree, the tree of life. Now, of course, and, and in heaven, uh, the church is the tree of light, and, and it is centered on Christ. And then the four beasts are centered around the throne of God. And, and so that is that is quite interesting. That And then the wheel within a wheel is that there's uh, the four beasts, and then there's Issachar, and and then uh, Asher and, and Manasseh and Simeon will be the second will, and the third will will be Zebulun, Naphtali, um, Benjamin, Gad, on there. And so that when this is in the air in Ezekiel, it is picturing all of Israel around those beasts. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, because there's no verse that actually applies that, but if you're looking at the illustrations of the temple being a, a picture of what's in heaven, and then also the camp of God being a picture of what's uh, around the throne of God, and focusing on God, so that picture kind of comes out in that in that illustration there, uh, Even and, and we can also see the allusion to Jesus Christ being uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah as well, uh, and so I thought that was interesting enough to bring up, but I'm not really going to say that it's scripture because it's just kind of out there, and we know this is in relation to the four beasts uh, in regards to Israel, but that we as the church are that lampstand in regards to Christ. Uh, and so that is, that's important to realize, and also that the, the, the bread stand and the, the bread loaves are a picture of each generation of the tribes of Israel. And that's something to keep in mind as we move forward with this, as it will have uh, bearing on what we read in the scriptures. And, and so, so I thought that was interesting. I thought we'd bring that up at the end there to, to keep that in mind uh, and that idea. And also it's just that it's just that when uh, and so when we are, when we have the, 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 the tr um, I'll try to figure this out, is that, is that the, the throne is symbolizing the, the kingdom uh, of Israel there, and they're centered around there, and the beast is picturing a, a beast, you know, the Bible talks, if you read about a beast, is that the, the Israel, as, as this picture is, is pictured as four beasts. Uh, a beast has no uh, intelligence, it has no spirit of God within it, uh, it's just natural. It's just a natural thing. Uh, and as we read, the Bible talks about how the, the spirit of a beast goes downward, spirit of a man goes upwards, and so forth and so uh, so this is physical uh, after beast and then the church of God is spiritual after Christ having his one spirit in us but this is having the four beasts uh, in their in that tribe and so it's something different it is what I'm trying to trying to get at to uh, is that I want to point out that the tribes and as a natural thing is something different than the spiritual thing uh, which is after Christ uh, and so we'll focus on that. We'll look at that a little bit as we go on, but that's not the primary focus I want. Like, again, uh, the focus I wanted on this uh, chapter is the fact that where are we in relation to God and in relation to the denominations and the relation to the local church, relation to the person who saved us, 
uh, in relation to doctrines in general, how do we learn and grow in our wilderness, wondering how are we supposed to be organized? Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, please bless you again. Lord, I pray that we'll uh, take this chapter and study it and to consider these things. To, to uh, Lord, I just pray that uh, those things that we're not quite sure on, uh, as, as to the relation of the tribes relating to your throne and to the temple, as to relation to the four beasts, if that be true, Lord, help us to understand that. If not, help us to clear that up and to, to keep that out of our doctrine, Lord. I just pray that you'll help us to, to, to figure that out and to learn that as we learn and grow together in the scriptures. Help us to be organized together as a local church, realizing our place before you and not uh, against all the other camps or tribes um, or families of your people, Lord, but rather uh, focus on where we are in relation to you. Uh, thank you again for the blessings you give to us, Lord, and just that prayer. Amen.